Philippians chapter 1 and verse 15 tonight. When you have it, say amen. amen. Can you say Lord Jesus? Lord Jesus? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. And now we pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes so that seeing we may see and open our ears so that hearing we may hear what the word of God is coming to us to say tonight and what the spirit of God is teaching us on tonight. Write your word into our hearts that we might not sin against you. And we promise to give you the praise. Renew our minds with your word, Lord God, that we could keep our minds stayed on you. And you promised if we would do that, you would keep us in perfect peace. And we give you praise tonight for your word in the name of Jesus. We love your word for it is a light unto our path and a lamp unto our pathway in the name of Jesus. And we give you all the glory. Holy Spirit, our senior pastor, senior teacher, take control of the Bible study. Use me for your glory and honor in the name of Jesus. And I promise to give you all of the praise and all of the glory in the mighty name of Jesus. And the people of God all said, come on and just give him just a praise tonight. Give him just a worship. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Philippians, the first chapter, and I'm going to pick it up at the 15th verse. And so Paul was saying that because he was incarcerated, he was in jail in Rome at that particular time. He says that people, amen, that brothers and sisters in the church had started to get bold and get confidence, amen, in preaching the gospel. They weren't afraid to go to jail because Paul was in jail, seemed to be doing fine preaching the gospel and so they begin to do even more preaching the gospel and they didn't care about being caught being put in jail they didn't have any more fear they just went forth and start preaching everywhere and so Paul was so excited about the preaching but then in the 15th verse he had to say something about the preachers he says in verse 15 when you have it say amen, amen. he said some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife in other words, he was saying a lot of them are just envious of the fact that because I'm in jail, they have an opportunity to be some great ones. They have an opportunity to be some great preachers. So they're really doing it because they're jealous of me and they're envious of me because they think I'm all that. He said, and some also of goodwill, some of them doing the preaching for the right reason. He said, the one preach Christ of contention or selfish ambition or I would say for argument's sake. He said, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, add affliction to my chains, make me suffer even more that I'm arrested and incarcerated in jail. And they're preaching, amen, argumentatively against what I've been preaching. He says, trying to add to my afflictions, add to the fact that I'm locked up in jail. This is making me feel worse to hear them preach Christ, not sincerely, supposing to add more afflictions to my incarceration. He said, but the other of love, knowing that I am set, I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Hallelujah to God. How I many know there's a difference between preaching and love? Amen. And so I heard a story one time. The preacher said there was a preacher that came to a church and he was a new preacher. And when he got there, he began to preach that Amen. All of the members were going to hell. And he began to preach, you're all going to hell. You're all going to hell. You're going to burn in hell. And the people got so angry with him that they went to the bishop and complained and said, Bishop, you got to remove this guy because he's preaching that we go to hell. And so the bishop removed him and he put another preacher up there. And the preacher got up to preach and he preached they were all going to hell. They were all going to hell. But they never complained. So one day the preacher came, the bishop came to hear how they were doing. And he asked him, how are you guys doing? They said, yeah, we're doing fine. How do you like the new preacher? He said, well, we love him. He said, yeah, what, what, what's happening? Is he different from another? He said, no, he preached the same thing. He preached that we go going to hell. He said, well, why didn't you complain about him? He said, because the first one was preaching that we were going to hell, and he was glad about it. He said, but the second one preaching we're going to hell, and he's breaking his heart. So sometimes it's not what you preach, but it's how you preach it. You know, somebody get that at 3 o'clock in the morning. Are you with me, somebody? He said, but the other of love, knowing. Underline that word, knowing. It's so important for you to know that I'm set, amen, or I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. In other words, no matter how you preach the Lord Jesus, he said, I'm set to defend this gospel because it's what I believe with all my heart. And then in verse 18, he went on to say, what then? 
He said, notwithstanding every way. He said, whether in pretense or in truth, he said, Christ is preached. He said, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Hallelujah. He said, I'm only glad I'm not mad about the ones preaching the Lord Jesus. However they preach him, he said, I'm just glad that they're preaching him. And it made him happy to know that they were preaching him, even though some of them he was upset with. Yet the end results was, I'm glad to hear that they're preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I rejoice. He says, yes. And I will rejoice. And then in verse 19, he goes on and says, he says, for I know. There he is with that I know again. How many know when you know something, it's hard for somebody to fool you? God said, my people are destroyed because of the lack of knowledge. In other words, the reason why God said you get destroyed is because you don't know any better. Somebody said, if you know better, you do better. And so when you get into the word of God, you're supposed to be knowing and growing. Are you with me? Paul said, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation. What was he talking about? The preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. He was saying that salvation there meant his deliverance because, again, he was incarcerated. But he's saying because the gospel is being preached and now everybody's preaching the gospel. They don't know who to lock up. Amen. He said they don't have enough jails. Amen. To lock up everybody. He said, so I know it's going to help me get out of here by them preaching all over the place. He says, through your prayers and the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. He says, I know. I shall, it shall turn to my salvation. In other words, my deliverance is going to come. I'm believing I'm going to get out of jail. He was supposed to be killed for preaching the gospel. But he said, now this thing is getting ready to turn around. He says, I believe that my deliverance is right near because of your prayers for me. Amen. And the supply of the Holy Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then in verse 20, he said, according to my honest expectation and my hope, that in nothing, how many? He said, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Hallelujah to God. In other words, even though I'm incarcerated, he said, I'm still preaching. And you know what? I'm not ashamed to be in jail. He said, because I'm in jail for a right reason. I'm in jail for preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, therefore, I'm not ashamed to be in jail. Somebody said, Paul, aren't you ashamed to be in jail? And you write letters to the churches. You got the nerve and you a jailbird. He said, listen, I might be in jail. He said, my body may be locked up. He said, but I'm free. Amen. He said that I'm free. And he said, I'm not ashamed of this bloody gospel. He says, but that with all boldness as always. So now he says, also Christ shall be magnified in my body. Hallelujah. He says, so even though I'm in jail, the Lord Jesus Christ is magnified. In other words, made bigger than this jailhouse, made bigger than the chains that I have, made bigger than my situation in my body. He said, whether it be by life or by death, Paul said, doesn't make him any difference one way or the other. He said, if they kill me, he said, that's going to be fine. He said, if I live, he said, that's going to be fine. How many know when you get to the point where it doesn't matter whether you live or die, amen, hallelujah. How many know you're free to live at that that particular point? And so Paul says, whether it be by life, he said, or by death, He says, I can magnify the Lord Jesus Christ in my body. Hallelujah. When you know you received him and you know he lives in your heart. How many know, saints of God, once he's in you, hallelujah, he said, lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. Are you with me, somebody? What a great feeling to know that the Lord Jesus Christ is in you. And Christ in you, the Bible said, is the hope of glory. So then he comes back in verse 21 and he says, for me to live is Christ. Oh, God. Somebody say, for me to live is my cell phone. Hello, somebody. Somebody else said, for me to live is my television. Somebody else said, for me to live is my job. For me to live is, but how many know, when you get it down to the fact that for me it's the Lord Jesus Christ, for me to live is him. It's all him. Because in him I live, in him I move, and in him I have my bed. And how many know he makes great things happen in your life? He said, for me to live is Christ. Watch this. And to die is gain. That man knew where he was going. He knew that death wasn't the final frontier. He knew that when he died, it was only a shortcut to his brand new home. Are you with me, somebody? So when the enemy come to threaten you about death, you ought to laugh at him. 
Tell him, go ahead and make my day. Because the next face I see is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ over in glory. Hallelujah. I don't have to pay any more taxes. I don't have to go to work anymore. I don't have to worry how I'm going. Hallelujah, somebody. I can give God praise. Now, I'm not trying to hurry my death. But if death comes, I'm going to give God praise. And whether I'm alive, I'm going to give God praise. It doesn't make any difference whether I live or die. I'm going to give God. When you can get to that point, saints of God, you know something. Are you with me, somebody? You know you're saved tonight. So Paul knew he was saved, amen. He knew that the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God was in his life, and it didn't make him no different. Whatever the will of God was for his life, that's exactly what he was going to receive. So in verse 22, he said, but if I live in the flesh, in other words, if I live in these earthly houses, these bodies, he says, this is the fruit of my labor. In other words, he said, if I live in my flesh, you're going to see me preaching just like I've been doing, just like I'm going to jail and in jail for preaching the gospel. He says, this is the fruit of my labor. In other words, you can see what I'm doing. You can see the results of my preaching. He says, yet what I shall choose, he said, I what not. Underline that word in the King James, what not. The word again is, I know not. He said, Whether, which way I choose, he said, I should know not. He said, in other words, I don't know which way I'm going to choose. Amen. He said, if I live in the flesh, he said, that's the fruit of my labor. I'm going to keep preaching and ministering. He said, and if I don't live, hallelujah, he said, whatever it is, he says, whatever I choose, he said, I don't know what I'm going to choose. I'm not even going to try to choose. And then he goes in verse 23 and listen to what he says. He said, for I'm in a strait. He said, I'm betwixt two. In other words, he's saying in, in verse 23, he says, I'm hard pressed. He says, I'm hard pressed. Anybody ever been hard pressed about a decision you had to make, about hard pressed, about what you should do, what, where you should go, how you should go about it? And Paul said, for I am hard pressed. He said, I'm in a strait. That word betwixt means that he was between two opinions. Amen. He was between two different things, two ideas. He says, First thing was having a desire to depart and to be with Christ. In other words, I have a desire to go to heaven. I want to be with the Lord Jesus. I really want to see more when you really saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. I mean, to know you have a desire to go home. I heard somebody say one time, uh, some guys walked into church and, and they, they had some guns. And they said, okay, all of you, we're getting ready to shoot all of you. We're going to kill you. And so they looked at him and they, and they said, and the guys with the guns looking at him, he says, okay, all of you that's not, that don't want to die, and all of you that's scared to die, get out of here right now. <laughs> Everybody flew out of the door and ran just as fast as they could. So it was, it was about 10 or 12 that stayed in there. And they had the gun. They said, you mean to tell me you're not afraid to die? We said, we're going to shoot you. We're going to shoot you. We're going to kill you. And the guy said, go ahead and kill us because we're going to heaven. It don't make us no different. He said, you're not afraid to die? They said, no. Matter of fact, we are glad about it. We're going home to be with the Lord. Go ahead and shoot. So then the guy say they laid the guns down and said, now we got rid of the hypocrites. Let's go ahead and praise God and give God the glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Did you see that, somebody? So Paul says, listen, I have a desire to go home, to depart, to be with the Lord. How many really want to go home to be with the Lord Jesus? Somebody say, I want to go, but not today. Are you with me, somebody? Hallelujah. So Paul says, to be with Christ, I'm ready to depart now. My ticket is punched. I'm standing at the airport. I'm ready to go home. Boy, that's when you know you're saved because somebody says, Lord, I don't know. I, I, somebody say, are you going to heaven when you die? Well, I don't know. I hope so. That person don't have a ticket. So he, Paul says to depart and to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he says, which is far better. He says, much better than me hanging around here, listening to the news, all the violence, all the crazy stuff going on. It's more better for me to go home to be with the Lord Jesus. And then in verse 24, he says, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh, to stay here in my body, to stay here alive in this world with you. He said, is more needful for you. He said, because as a minister, I'm able to give you more word. I'm able to help you grow. I'm helping you to help be saved, helping you to be filled with the Holy Ghost. So I would stay here only because it would be an opportunity for me to help you get further in the Lord. And in verse 25, he says, and having this confidence, in other words, one way or the other, he said, it doesn't matter. I want to stay here if I can to help you. But really, if I had it my way, I'd rather go home to be with the Lord Jesus. He said, and having this confidence, in other words, that I know where I'm going. He says, I know. Look at that. Underline that in your Bible. He says, I know. How many know you're going to heaven? How many know heaven is already made? How many know you're going to see the Lord Jesus face to face and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant? How many know? He says, I know. He said that I shall abide 
In other words, I don't believe I'm going to die. He said, and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. In other words, Paul says, I believe God's going to leave me here. And one reason why he came to that conclusion was that the Philippian church had raised a big offering for him. And they had sent the money to him while he was still in jail. So Paul, when he got the money, the blessing, he said, wow, the Philippians sent me all this money. Amen. For me. He said, must have sent it for me to stay in the ministry. So I must not be going anywhere. They must not going to kill me because God wouldn't have had them to bring all this money if I wasn't getting out of jail and going on in the gospel. Hallelujah. And so that was his evidence. That was his confidence that he knew that he would abide in the flesh for them and continue, he said, with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. In other words, for your progress, for your growth. How many know God wants you to grow? Some people think just because you recite a prayer and receive the Lord Jesus that you got everything you need. But how many know that's just the beginning? How many know you grow from that? How many know you grow in grace and wisdom and understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ? And then he goes on in verse 26 and he says that you're rejoicing. There he goes with that Joy, rejoice. See, you got to have joy in order to rejoy. And so the word rejoice, that word re on the front of rejoicing is actually again means to rejoice or to have joy again. So how do you have joy again? Well, you think about the joy that you got when you first received the Lord Jesus Christ and you have that joy again and again. That's why he says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Hallelujah to God. We'd have much more happier people in the church, amen, if they would just rejoice, amen, about everything. Rejoice that I'm going to heaven. Just rejoice, amen, and continue to rejoice. Get your joy over and over again because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Hello, somebody. Do anybody have any joy in here tonight? Some of y'all looking like a new calf look at the gate, amen. You don't have no joy. But the joy, amen, and how many know this? the Lord Jesus that gives you joy? He said that you're, jo you're rejoicing, that's having your joy all over again. He said, be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. So he said, when I show up again at your front door, Philippian church, and now remember he's in Rome. He said, but I'm, and when I get out, he said, I'm coming to see you all because that money that you gave me is going to help pay my ticket. And the first person I'm going to go, people I want to see is the Philippian church because you're the ones that stuck with me, stayed by me with prayers and with offerings. So I'm able to come. He said, and when I come, it's going to be better than when I started the church 10 years ago. When I show up and you see my face, oh, my God, we're going to celebrate the Lord. We're going to, we're going to give him praise. We're going to give him glory. He said, we're going to be rejoicing. Amen. When I see you. Amen. And I haven't seen you in 10 years. And in verse 27, he said, only let your conversation. That word is an interesting word, not just talking, but also your behavior. So he said, oh, only let your behavior. Your conduct, amen, your conduct, amen. He said, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Let your conduct and behavior, amen, be, be let it becometh, let it be becoming the gospel. In other words, you represent as an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ everywhere you go. Not, isn't it funny how we can live good in church? But how many know God wants you to live good in your house? How many know God wants you to live good at the mall? God wants you to live good on your job. He wants you to be holy everywhere you go. Are you with me, somebody? We'd have more people in the church if we had more Christians that were the same as they were in the church. They'd be the same on their job. They'd be the same in their house. They'd be the same everywhere. Are you with me, somebody? And always remember somebody watching you. Soon as you say you're a member of the church, they start watching you. They watch everything you do. And they can find fault with some Christians, I'm telling you. It's funny how unsaved people know more about living saved than saved people. Are you with me, somebody? Because they can point, well, oh, no, they're not saved because if they were saved, they wouldn't be doing. How you know about being saved and you not? Are you with me, somebody? He said, only let your, be, your behavior, your conduct, he said, be as it becometh. In other words, that it becometh the gospel of Christ. In other words, let people know I'm saved in the church house. I'm saved in my house. I'm saved, amen, in the storehouse. I'm saved everywhere I go. I live a saved life. I'm not, I'm not wishy-washy. I'm not two-faced. Hello, somebody. Amen. I'm not a double agent. Are you with me, somebody? I am what I am in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm the same as I am in the church house as I am in my own house. Are you with me, somebody? Sometimes people get home and they get quiet by themselves, turn the lights off. They don't think nobody can see them. But how many know God can look through the dark? Are you with me, somebody? 
So he said, having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of the faith that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. He said, only let your conduct, your behavior be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. In other words, if you save living for the Lord Jesus, stand up boldly for him. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Tell everybody I'm saved. And then they'll know whether or not you really are. He said that whether I come and see you, which is his desire to come see them, he said, or else be absent. In other words, things could change, and he might even go ahead and kill him. He said, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit. In other words, the unity and the harmony in the church. We got so much disunity in the churches today. He said that you would stand fast in one spirit. In other words, we'd all be united, amen, in one spirit. What spirit is that? I believe it's the Holy Spirit. Are you with me, somebody? And so he says, with one mind, hallelujah. What mind would we have, saints of God? We'd have the word of God as our mind. Are you with me, somebody? He says, striving together. In other words, working together for the faith. Of the gospel. Are you with me, somebody? So it would be a unit, united effort. It would be harmonious. Are you with me, somebody? Because the Bible said, where there's unity, there's strength. Are you with me, somebody? Hallelujah. So the devil always want to divide the saints. Want you to be off by yourself. Because the devil believe in isolation, but God believe in unity. Are you with me, somebody? So he says one could put a thousand to flight, but two could put ten thousand to flight. You're ten thousand times stronger when you got somebody with you. Oh, God, I can't get no help in here. I like being by myself. Yeah, but you're only 1,000 times strong. Amen. And if 2,000 demons come and get you, your goose is cooked. Are you with me, somebody? But if you got another person with you, you guys can handle 10,000 devils coming against you in the name of Jesus. I don't know, but I like to be 10,000 times stronger than what I am when I'm by myself. So Paul is rolling out something for us, and I believe he rolls out about seven different ingredients, different principles that we really need to grab a hold of. The first one is, he says, let your behavior, your conduct be as becometh the gospel of Christ. In other words, don't be one thing in the church and be something else when you leave. He said that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. Amen. He wasn't talking about having no strange sexual affairs he sees talking about your behaviors amen he said that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind watch this striving together for the faith of the gospel working together in unity my god and then he says in verse 28 and i love it he said and nothing terrified by your adversary in other words when the devil show his head you ought to start laughing hallelujah you ought to go to laugh he said say Donna, you devil you think you're going to defeat me now in the name of Jesus when the Lord Jesus Christ is living in me and greater is he that's living in me you must don't know I know that I have authority over you in the name of Jesus now get out of my face in the name of Jesus somebody need to learn how to cast the devil out in the name of how many know you have authority over him come on somebody and so Paul said, nothing. How many? He said, in nothing, no thing, terrified by your adversaries. Who's your adversaries? Demons, devils, and people that the devil would use to come against you. So ain't no sense in fighting with people and arguing with people and fussing with people and letting the devil get you to cussing with people. Just step back and say, you know what? You, you better get out of my face. No, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about that, that spirit that's operating in you. I'm taking authority over that spirit in the name of Jesus. Devil, you better get on away from me in the name of Jesus because you don't know who I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and I've got the authority over you to cast you out, devils, and I command you to get out of my face in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You're talking to me. No, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about that spirit that's operating in you in the name of Jesus. Can you give God praise? Touch your neighbor, tell your neighbor you have a, oh, too bad. You don't have no neighbor. Okay, well, hallelujah. So now what? <laughs> Sitting all back there by yourself, that's what you get. And he said, nothing, ter I love that, nothing terrified by your adversaries. He says, now watch this, which is to them an evident token of perdition. What did he say you didn't get? Let me, let me see if I can break it down, amen, in the Greek. He says in verse 28, he says, no way. He says, no way which is to them an evident token, which means it's a proof of perdition, which means destruction. So in other words, he's saying, by you not being terrified by the devils coming at you any kind of way because you know you have authority over them, he says, to them it's an evident, it's evidence, or rather it's no way, amen, which to them, he says, an evident token 
Did you get that? He said, he said, it's, in other words, that evident token actually means it's proof. He said, which is to them an evident token, which it means it's proof. And that word perdition is destruction in the Greek. So he, he said, it's evident proof of their destruction. Are you with me, somebody? In other words, the devils are defeated in your life. I said the devils are defeated in your life. Somebody ought to give God praise. The devil is defeated in your life. So stop giving place to him and tell him to get out of your face in the name of Jesus. See, if you don't put him out, he's not going to go. I said, if you don't put him out, he's not going to go. And don't pray and ask the Lord to do it because the Lord has given you authority to do it yourself. Some people don't cast him out because I think they like his company. So he says, watch this now. He says, he said, it's an evident, it's the proof of his, uh, the demon's destructions. He said, but to you, it's the proof that you really saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. It's proof of your salvation and that of God. In other words, you know it's of God because you have authority, you have power over all the demons that are coming against you. Oh, my God, what kind of saint are you? And verse 29, he goes on to say, for unto you, unto who? He said, for unto you, it is given in the behalf of Christ, in other words, on Christ's behalf, not only to believe on him, the Lord Jesus, but also to suffer for his sake. Now, this is always interesting to me, be interesting to me because how can you be rejoicing and be overcoming one time, and then the next thing you know, he's talking about suffering. What, what does he mean by suffering? Well, he means this. When things come against you, you want to handle it your way. When somebody come against you, you know what I'm saying? Oh, not you. You, you ain't. You, you're not going to let nobody run over you. Not you. Not the way you know how to handle people. Not where you come from. Hello, somebody. So, so it seemed like you're suffering because it seemed like you're taking things. It seemed like things are coming against you, and you're looking like a chump. You're looking like a weak need ninny. You're looking like a weakling. You're looking at, amen, somebody that's just running. But really and truly, it just means that you have power, but you have your power under control. Are you with me, somebody? You can look at him and smile because you say, you know what? God told me vengeance is mine, said the Lord. He said, I will repay. So all I'm going to do is turn you over to the Lord Jesus, and he's going to take care of you. Are you with me, somebody? So I don't need to fight with nobody. He said, even though my insides would say, hit him, hit him, hit him, smack him. Inside. But I would cast that thought down and I would just love them in Jesus' name and turn them over to the Lord. So on one side, it seemed like I'm suffering. He said, but on the other side, I'm giving God glory for the power that God has given me for Jesus Christ's sake. And then he said, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. What was the conflict? He said, my conflict was whether or not I was going to go home to be with the Lord or whether or not I was going to stay here to be with you all, whether they were going to kill me and I was going to give my life for the gospel of the Lord Jesus or that I was going to live on and continue to preach for the Lord. He said, that was kind of a conflict in me. He says, and you might have a conflict in you. He said tonight, you may have a conflict about what you should do, what decision you should make, how you're going to live for the Lord, whether or not you're going to give up this or give up that. Sometimes it's about a giving up and stuff we don't want to give up. We love that chocolate donut. Hello, somebody. We, if we don't want to get that, I don't care what that diet say. We going to. Your body be saying, get it, grab it. You be saying, no, no. And he be saying, yeah, yeah. You be saying, no, yeah, yeah, no, no. Why you downing it badly? Watch this now, the second chapter we're coming in. Okay, we're doing all right? Watch this now. He's finished the first chapter, and he eases into the second chapter. He's talking about the Lord Jesus' humiliation and exaltation. How I many know with humiliation comes exaltation? Many people can't be exalted because they don't know how to humble themselves. You don't have to always get the last lick in. You don't have to always get the last word in. How I many know you can let people say whatever they want to say? Hello, somebody. As long as you know it's a lie, what, what do you care about? So he starts off by saying in the second chapter, he said, if there be any, he said, if there be therefore any consolation, in other words, any encouragement in Christ, and that's what we want to do, encourage one another, amen, to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He said, if there be therefore any comfort, and that word, I mean, consolation, it actually means encouragement, amen, in the Greek. He said, if there be any consolation or encouragement in Christ, then he said, if any comfort, that word is comfort is also consolation, consoling or solace. He says, of love. He said, if any fellowship, stay right there. If any fellowship 
of the Spirit. He said fellowship of the Spirit. And it should read fellowship in the Spirit and fellowship with one another because of the Spirit of God in every one of us, we're able to fellowship. Amen? What is fellowship? Fellowship is being fellows in the ship. And thank God we wasn't on that duck boat. Are you with me, somebody? I'm praying for the families of the duck boat. Wasn't that tragic? Amen? The duck boat? Amen? So he said in the Spirit, he says, if any bowels, that word bowels is another word for affections. He said, if there's any affections and mercies, that word mercies in the Greek is also sympathies. Amen. He said, he's playing on you now. He's working your emotions. He said, if there's any affections that you have in your life or any sympathies that you may have in your life, he says in verse 2, fulfill ye my joy. Hallelujah. He said, in other words, make me happy. Make the joy of the Lord flood my soul. In other words, make my joy complete is what he's saying when he says, fulfill you my joy. He said that you be like-minded. Uh-oh. What if every one of us had the same mind? Hallelujah to God. If we had the same mind, that you be like-minded. Amen. Everybody hearing the word of God, how many know, but not everybody's receiving the word of God in their mind. How many know we get our minds renewed by the word of God? So all of us are receiving the word of God tonight. So Paul said it would be great and it would make his joy complete or fulfill his joy that you be like-minded. That's number one. Put number one by like-minded. In other words, when you're like-minded, there won't be no fights. When you're like-minded, won't no be anybody, amen, going at each other. When you're like-minded, won't be no fussing and arguing and falling out and all that discord, amen, and all that stuff on the internet. Are you with me, somebody? When you're all like-minded, amen. And then he says, number two, he said, having the same love. In other words, the love of God is not different from saint to saint. How many know the agape kind of love is the same for everybody? And with everybody. And when you love me like I love you, like God loves you, like God loves me, and we begin to love each other with the God kind of love, how many know that love is so powerful, amen, we will be tighter than our own blood families because the love of God would keep us, amen, and unite us as a family of God. Are you with me, somebody? Amen. So he says, watch this now, that you be like-minded, having the same love, no different love, amen, not that two-faced stuff, that grin in your face and talk about you like a dog behind your back. He said, having the same love, being of, and we treat everybody the same instead of those picks and chooses. We got our gang members that we favor. Hello, somebody. And, and, but they're different from the other folks in the church. Hello, somebody. We have the Hatfields and the McCoys. Are you with me, somebody? He said that we have the same love. That's number two. And then he says, number three, being of one accord. Being in one accord. In other words, when we come to church, we come to church. We're not looking at each other, not trying to see who's got on the best clothes and who's dressed the best. Or who's this. We came to praise the Lord. We came to give God glory. And if we all begin to praise God and give him the glory. But you know, in the church, there's always some folks kick back like they had a ball game. Are you with me, somebody? When you learn to come to church and give God praise and give God glory, and you're not ashamed to stand on your feet and lift up your hands and open your mouth and begin to worship the Lord and give him praise, and you don't care who's looking at you, because they didn't save you. They're not blessing you. They're not giving you the miracles that God has given you. And you don't mind praising him. You're not ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we got some folks that's self-conscious. And they say, oh, I don't want to make a public display. Listen, God made a public display for you. When the Lord Jesus hung out on Calvary, it was a public display. Are you with me, somebody? He was right out in the open, amen, hanging on a cross for you and for me. And if he can be in the open with an open display and sacrificing his life for you and me, surely we can stand and give God praise and give him the glory, amen, being not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take that Bible out of that brown bag, amen, and let people see. So he said, being on one accord, that means for all of us in a Honda. Are you with me, somebody? All of us riding in the Honda. Being on one accord. Then, then he goes on with, with number four. He says, of one mind. Well, how can we all have one mind? This person thinking about this, this person thinking about that, this person thinking about this. Well, we all have one mind when all of our mind is full of the word of God. So now all of our mind is filled with the word of God. That's why the Bible said we have the mind of Christ. How do we have the mind of Christ? I used to ponder that. How do we get the mind of Christ? Because our mind is renewed by the word of God. And the only thing that's in our mind now is the word of God. Hallelujah to God. What if your mind was a walking Bible? 
What if your Bible had the, the gospel of Mark and Luke and, and Matthew and John, amen, and Acts, and you had First and Second Corinthians, and you had Philippians, and you had Ephesians, and you all in your mind, all in your mind. And so if you could take care of your mind and keep your mind stayed on him, the Bible said he'd keep you in perfect peace. Well, how do you stay on him? By staying in the word. I talked about it on Sunday, by staying in the Word. And every time your mind pick up something that's ungodly, unholy, reach up and grab that thought and throw it out of your mind, casting down imagination and every high thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought, amen, to the obedience of Christ. Are you with me, somebody? That means that your mind is filled with the Word of God. You can't fill your mind with the Word of God if you're watching porn. I mean, uh, you can't fill your mind with the Word of God if you're watching all that crazy stuff on TV. Are you with me, somebody? And all the movies that they got with all that risque stuff you'd be looking at, you'd be filling your mind with hope. And then when you close your eyes, your mind will turn the television on in your mind, and it'll show you all those images all over again. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to tell you. So if you want to see your mind get off of that crazy stuff, get your mind on the Word of God and reprogram your mind by the Word of God. David said it beautifully tonight. David, you did a good job. Amen. If I get the Word of God in my mind, it's going to get down in my heart. How do I know it's in my heart? Because out of the abundance of my heart, that's the deal. My mouth's going to talk about it. Is that right? So if you want to get your mind straightened out, get your heart straightened out. And if you want to get your heart straightened out, Get your mind full of the word of God. Is he with me, somebody? So let me see. Where am I at? He said, okay, a one mind. And then he said, he goes on. This is number five. He said, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. In other words, don't do things for argument, for argumental sake. Don't do things, amen, because you want to get the glory, because you want to make yourself look good. That's not the reason to do things. Do things so God can be glorified. Do things so, amen, don't worry about who gets the credit. Just get the job done. Are you with me, somebody? He said, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. He said, but in lowliness of mind, here's number six. He said, but in lowliness of mind, that's your humility right there. In lowliness of mind, that's that humility. He said, let each esteem other better than themselves. So the Lord said, if you really want to see a blessing, brag on your brother. Say something good about your brother instead of when your brother walk away and say, look at him. They think they something. They, I mean, it's funny. Backbiting is surely popular in the church. Are you with me, somebody? But what if we front bit? Amen. What if we front? Amen. Talked about people and just and said something good about everybody. What if we just bless everybody? Amen. How many know we are being blessed right now? Are you with me? So if you know you're being blessed by Almighty God. Why wouldn't you go ahead and bless other people, amen? Why wouldn't you bless other people? How many know the more you bless people, how many know the more God's going to bless you? Are you with me, somebody? So he said, watch this now. He says, esteem, that means to lift up or encourage or say something good about others. He said, better than themselves. No, people want you to talk good about them. And if you don't talk good about them, they'll talk good about themselves. See how great I am? See how wonderful I am? See, I did all that. He says, esteem others better than yourself. Okay, did you see that? And then finally, number seven, these are seven principles that we can apply to our lives to have a better, harmonious, loving, wonderful, amen, single-minded church all on the Lord Jesus Christ. If we would adopt these principles, he said, principle number seven is in verse four. He says, look not every man on his own things. Some people, all they're concerned about is me and my. Me, my wife, my son, his wife, and no more. We only pray for me and mine. Some of us just pray for me. Are you with me, somebody? He said, but look not every man on his own things. He said, but every man also on the things of others. Are you with me, somebody? So look and see with your brothers and sisters if they need something, amen, or if it look like they're coming short of something and you can help them, don't shut up your bowels of compassion. God said, how dwelleth the love of God in you? If you see your brother or sister have a need and you shut up your bowels of compassion and you don't try to help them, God said, how dwelleth the love of God in you? The love of God is always trying to help somebody. Watch how this thing works. The more I help other people, the more God sin to help me. Are you with me, somebody? How many know I reap everything I sow? Every time. That's why I'm always trying to help somebody, and God always send me some people to help me. Are you with me, somebody? How many know it's a reaping and sowing kind of thing? I'm trying to go. Watch this now. I'm trying to go. He said, now watch this now. Then he turns the table on us right now in verse 5. He said, let this mind, uh-oh. He said, let this mind, 
In other words, you have an opportunity to either let your mind think about godly things and holy things or let your mind think about unholy things and ungodly things. He said, you have control of your mind. After all, whose mind is it? So he said, let this mind, in other words, let me translate, let this mind is actually translated, keep thinking this. We got, we got on to that Sunday. He said, keep thinking this. In other words, let this mind be in you, watch this, which was also in Christ Jesus. I used to ponder, how could we have the mind that was also in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because guess what was in his mind? Guess what was in the Lord Jesus' mind? Anybody know what was in the Lord Jesus' mind? It was nothing but the word of God. So let me ask you a question. What's in your mind? If the word of God is in your mind, then you wouldn't be thinking about nothing else but him. You'd keep your mind on him. Not Creta, not Junebug, hello, not porno, not naked women. And I said it on Sunday, a man thinks about sex every seven seconds. Sisters. I knew it was like that, Brother Bob. Every seven So he said, in order for you not to do that, he said, let this mind, he said, in other words, keep thinking, keep your mind thinking. He said, the same way the Lord Jesus Christ kept his mind, because we have the same mind, if our minds are renewed by the word of God. So he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he said, who, watch this now, how was the Lord Jesus? He said, who being in the form of God, he was actually the Word of God made flesh. Are you with me, somebody? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word of God was made flesh. He was actually God, with God. He was God. He said, being in the form of God, which he was, he said, thought it not robbery, watch this now, to be equal with God. He's the second person of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Word, God the Holy Spirit. But he was able to... To unload, if you please, or, or to, to ex let all of his godliness inside come out of him so he can become a man. Watch this. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. He said, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, of a slave. That word servant is doulos, which means slave. Took on him the form of a slave, even though he was the word of God made flesh. He was the second person of the Godhead. Hello, somebody. He said he was made in the likeness of men. He became a man, and he was a man. Amen. But he was the word of God, but he was made into the likeness of a man. He said, and watch this now. I'm going home. He said, being found in fashion, underline that word, fashion being found in appearance as a man he humbled him. he did what he humbled him. there's no way satan could have took the lord jesus out are you with me somebody he had the power to call down seven thousand twelve thousand legions of angels and it would have wiped all of them off the face of the planet he said being found in fashion or in appearance as a man watch this now he humbled himself that's 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 a big word right there he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, a terrible way to die, a suffering way to die, got whipped and beat, but nailed to a tree, nailed to a cross. He humbled himself to die, hallelujah, when he didn't have to do it, but he did it because he loved you and me so much. That he died for us on that cross. We don't hear that enough, but he died for you. Don't you dare say you ain't worth nothing. The Lord Jesus gave his life for you. And then he says this. Watch this. I'm going home. He said, wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. How, how was he able to be highly exalted? Because he lowly humbled himself. Are you with me, somebody? Anytime you're able to humble yourself, somebody, and you're able to go low, are you with me? Then God is able to raise you up for his glory and honor. He's able to exalt you. Are you with me, somebody? He said, well, for God has, watch this, highly exalted him, the Lord Jesus. And watch this, and given him a name which is above every name. That word above every name means a more excellent name than any name in the universe is the name of Jesus. Are you with me, somebody? Hallelujah to God. 
Hallelujah. Can somebody say, Lord Jesus? Lord Jesus. Then I'm going to close with this one right here. He said that at the name of Jesus. <laughs> it's holy name. It's a powerful name. It's God-given name. Are you with me, somebody? At the name of Jesus, he said, every knee should bow. Are you with me, somebody? Hallelujah. He said, of things in heaven, underline that word, things, because the translation in the Greek is those, those, those things, those people that are in heaven, hallelujah, and those people that are in the earth, and those people that are under the earth. Do you know there's people under the earth right now? People that are waiting for the resurrection, amen, people that are waiting for the judgment, that they're still alive, they're not dead. Are you with me, somebody? But they're underneath the earth. Are you with me, somebody? In a place called Sheol. Are you with me, somebody? And verse 11, I'm going home. He said, and that every tongue, how many? Every tongue should confess what? Hallelujah. Come on, stand on your feet to the glory and honor of God the Father. How many tongues? Every tongue shall confess. That's what the devil hate for you to say worse than anything else in your life. When you can open your mouth and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Come on and give God praise. Come on and give him the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anybody ready to meet the Lord Jesus tonight? Anybody ready? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Does it make a difference to you whether you live or die? Hallelujah, because your ticket is punched and you know you're on your way to heaven. You know you're saved. You know you're sanctified. You know you're filled with the Holy Ghost and you know you're ready. If the Lord call you tonight, you can go home, amen, with joy and give him praise. And the devil can't intimidate you. He can't put fear in your heart because you can tell the devil, devil, get out of my face in the name of Jesus because Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. Come on and give him the praise tonight. Come on and give him the glory. Come on and rejoice tonight. Come on, rejoice. Hallelujah. Rejoice in the Lord always. Hallelujah. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice, saints of God. Rejoice. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but came and made himself of no reputation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah in the name of Jesus. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. He's our King. Are you with me, somebody? You can give him the glory tonight. You don't need to be afraid of nobody. Are you with me, somebody? In the name of Jesus. And if your adversaries is coming against you, you can cast them out of your face. In the name of Jesus, because you have power. You've got power over all the enemy that's coming against you. In the name of Jesus, can you give God praise tonight? Can you give him the glory? Hallelujah to God. God wants you to have your joy back. Come on and get your joy back. Come on and rejoice, somebody. Hallelujah. Come on and get happy tonight. If Jesus is your Lord, if he's your Lord and Savior, and you can confess with your mouth, come on and get your joy back. For the joy of the Lord is your strength tonight. In the name of Jesus, come on and give him glory. I don't know about you, but I love to praise him. And I love to give him the glory. He's done so many things for me. And he keeps on doing great things. And I have to keep on praising him. I found out the more you praise him, the more you praise him, it seems like the more he blesses you. It's the more you praise him, the more you give him the glory, the more you can open your mouth and make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye land. We can serve the Lord with gladness. We can come before his presence with singing and know ye that the Lord, he is God. He's he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with nothing but praise. In the name of Jesus, can you give him the glory tonight? Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm glad tonight. You don't know how glad I am. I'm glad. Anybody glad? Anybody glad? Just get glad tonight. Tell him I'm glad I'm saved tonight. I'm glad I've been born again. I'm glad I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm glad I got my ticket punched. I'm glad I'm on my way to heaven. In the name of Jesus, I don't care when it is. I'm ready whenever. In Jesus' name. But in the meantime, while I'm here, I got to tell somebody that Jesus is Lord. I got to tell somebody that he's the Savior of sinners. 
I gotta tell somebody. He's a doctor that never lost a case. I gotta tell somebody. He's a king of kings. He's a lord of lords. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Can you give him the glory? Can you give him the praise? Hallelujah. 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 Hey, 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 hey. Hallelujah. 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 I don't care what situation you're in. Get ready because God is getting ready to bring you out of it. I said God is getting ready to bring you out of it. In the name of Jesus, can you say Lord Jesus? Come on and fire your weapon. Come on and fire your weapon. Can you say Lord Jesus? You're getting ready to come out of that situation. You're getting ready to come out of that problem. You're getting ready to come out of that situation. And you're going to come out uh, with the victory in your life. Uh, in the name of Jesus, I heard the Lord say, Weeping may endure for the night, uh, but joy coming in the morning. You got some joy coming. You got your joy coming. In the name of Jesus, come on and give him the praise. Come on and give him the glory. Hallelujah. Hey. Hey. Hallelujah. 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 If I'm talking to you tonight, I want you to come out in that aisle and I want you to make your way to the altar tonight. I just want to pray for you tonight. Come on, somebody. It's time for you to get your blessing. It's time for you to get your miracle. It's time for you to get your deliverance. It's time for you to get your joy back. It's time for you to get your power back. It's time for you to get your strength back. In the name of Jesus, and I'm glad you're here tonight because I believe God. I can feel the Holy Ghost moving right now, right now, right now, right now, right now. Come on, somebody. Come running, running, running. Come running, running, running. Come running, running, running. Tell him, yes, Lord. Tell him, I know that's me. I know that's me. And I need power tonight. I need power because what I'm going through, I need some power for what I've been up against. I need some power because the enemy is trying to tear me up. But the devil is a liar. I said the devil is a liar. In the name of Jesus, come out of that situation. Come out of that problem. Come out of that trouble. In the name of Jesus, and now open your mouth and give God the glory. I'm going to pray for you, but I want you right now to start praising him. Open your mouth and praise him. Lift your hands and praise him. Stomp your feet and praise him. Shout hallelujah and praise him. Open your mouth wide and he's going to fill it up with the Holy Ghost and fire in the name of Jesus. Come on and give him the glory. Come on and give him the glory. Hallelujah. Come on and praise him. Come on and praise him. Tell him, yes, Lord. I'm yes, Lord. Tell him I'm here tonight. I'm ready tonight. Fill me the more with the Holy Ghost. Fill me with your power, Lord. Fill me with your goodness, Lord. Fill me. Hallelujah. And as we close, I wouldn't want to close the broadcast without an opportunity for you to receive the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in your life. That's right. You don't have to go down to the church just yet. But what you need to do is invite him, the Lord Jesus, into your heart. And we can do that very easily. Are you ready for that? Come on right now. Close your eyes with me and let's pray. Lord Jesus, come on, just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, forgive me for all of my sins. I believe that you died on the cross and you were buried and on the third day, God the Father raised you from the dead. And right now, Lord Jesus, I open the door to my heart and I receive you into my heart as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, come on and celebrate. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Heaven is rejoicing right now. Give God praise. Come on, give him the glory. Come on right now. I know you're happy. I know you're feeling good. We want to hear from you right now as we close the broadcast. Call us right now. Once again, that number, 
2342. Call us right now. We want to hear from you. Every one of you that prayed that prayer, we want to know who you are. And listen, we're going to be continually praying for you around the clock that God would continue to bless you and your family in Jesus' name. See you next time.